Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today, we're continuing our ongoing coverage of the war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. And today, we're back uh, in the vicinity of Avdivka. Now, this has been a disaster for the Ukrainian military. It is believed that the Ukrainians believed, as did their Western counterparts, the United States, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, believed that those Ukrainian forces in and around Avdivka were going to be able to hold out uh, for much longer than anticipated. So why did Avdivka fall? What is the main reason? Was it because Russian forces were enveloping Avdivka? Were they cutting off Ukrainian supply lines? That's one reason. But how did the Russians put themselves in a position to section off and envelop Avdivka from multiple directions? They changed their doctrine. They changed their strategy. The Russians adopted the use of standoff glide bombs. And they used large amounts of these systems. At the onset of the war, the Russians used precision-guided munitions. They had precision-guided standoff capability, but it was of limited use. Mostly, at the start of the war, the Russians would still fly over a target with either Su-25s or Su-34 fullbacks and drop dumb bombs, risking the pilot and the aircraft. Because of the inflow of, of uh, Western air defense systems and the integrated air defense network uh, using S-300 books, what have you, of the Ukrainians, using these older uh, former Soviet systems, put many of these Russian aircraft in jeopardy. So the Russians had to adapt. The United States, for a long time, has used these uh, joint direct attack munitions, JDAMs, with these glide kits. Very accurate, with very long range, giving aircraft the opportunity to not fall into the air defense envelope of opposing nation states. We've seen the progression of the JDAM to even the small diameter bomb with even greater range, with the capability of attacking moving targets. Now, the Russians didn't have this capability. It took this war for the Russians to adopt these weapon systems. And at first, they were very crude. And we're starting to see them becoming more advanced. The Russians are getting better with these glide bombs. They have their own satellite navigational system, GLONASS. So the systems, the rudimentary systems, are in place for the Russians to have this capability. It was just a capability that, at the time of the conflict, the Russians did not believe they need it. They had the capability of dropping a Glo- GLONASS uh, guided bomb, but glide bombs were limited. They didn't see the use. But with the war in these uh, very uh, protected, fortified zones such as Avdivka led to the Russian use or mass use 
of these very large, very powerful, somewhat accurate glide systems. This is what gave the Russians, using large amounts of these glide bombs, focusing them on Ukrainian battlefield units, fortifications, what have you. Look, a aerial dropped bomb is much larger and much more powerful than a traditional artillery munition. It is many times bigger and packs a lot more explosives. I mean, you're talking something that weighs uh, 100, 200 pounds to something that weighs in excess of 2,000 pounds with 1,000 pounds of explosives. And these glide bombs put the Russian aircraft outside of that air defense envelope. So they were able to hammer Ukrainian forces for several weeks. And it was something that the Ukrainians had not yet experienced. They have experienced direct air attack by Russian forces, but the mass use of these glide bombs, where you don't even hear an aircraft, many times you don't even hear the bomb that strikes your position. So now what's going to happen? Well, we have essentially about 35,000 to 50,000 Russian troops that can now be freed up for other areas. We have the Russian tactical air capability, the Russian Air Force, that was being used within the vicinity of Adivka to attack Ukrainian targets. So where is that going to shift? What are the Russians going to go after next? Now, obviously, we've heard that the Russians could continue to press within the vicinity of Avdivka, a possible move to the north near either Seversk or uh, Kupiansk further to the north. But we also have a buildup of Russian forces in Zaporizhia. So why is Zaporizhia quite possibly more important than other targets in the east? And why could the Russians be looking more towards an offensive towards Orkiv along the uh, eastern bank of the Dnieper River, or the left bank of the Dnieper River? And again, the reason they call that the left bank is if you were looking south along the Dnieper River, the left bank would be on your left-hand side. But why the Russians could be looking at a move in Zaporizhia focused on Orkiv is if the Russians are able to drive up this eastern bank of the Dnieper River and continue up, they would start cutting off the ability of the Ukrainian state, the Ukrainian military, and its Western allies to supply the armies, the Ukrainian forces in Kharkov, Kramatorsk, Slovyansk, and other areas along the front line. Moving up the Dnieper River in this direction here would start to reduce the ability of Ukrainian forces to feed and supply its army. If the Russians push up along the Dnieper River, they are going to be able to expand their own air defense envelope, while at the same time bringing to bear tactical and strategic air assets that can drop massive amounts of these glide bombs on Ukrainian targets. Ukrainian targets, Ukrainian bridges, Ukrainian infrastructure that has to cross the Dnieper River. So we, we're going to watch this area very closely. Now, could it be a ruse? Could the Russians be looking at continuing operations towards Kramatorsk and other areas in the east? Possibly. 
the Russians could also be entering a phase in which we are seeing the expansion of the Russian military, the expansion of the Russian military-industrial complex, in which the Russians can launch multi-front operations. So not just operations towards Kramatorsk, but operations towards Zaporizhia. Operations towards the Nepro. The cutting off of Ukrainian supplies from its armies in the east. In the early stages of this conflict, we here at MFAM believed that this would become a mainstay of the Russian strategy. We did not believe in the early phases of the conflict that the Russians would look for a decapitation strike, a move towards Kiev. We believe the Russians would try to stay on the eastern bank of the Dnieper River. Here, we here at MFAM believed only that a mobilization by the Russian military would result in a Russian capability to move on Kiev. Now, the Russians are getting there. The West has awoken a sleeping giant. Say that again. The West has awoken a sleeping giant. The Russian military capacity is growing. It continues to grow day by day. Now we're going to have to watch very closely what comes next. Because the same tactics, the same strategy, the same doctrine that was successfully used in the defeat of Ukrainian forces in Adivka are going to be used in other areas. Again and again and again. And the key reason for that is, as we have talked about before, the Russians have a very large air force and the Ukrainians do not. And that ultimately is going to be the deciding factor in this conflict. Military production capacity and who has the largest and most capable air capability. That's all we have for today. Thanks for joining us. More to come very, very soon. As always, have a good day.